We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Our social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to go through the website. That way they get logged, they get notifications. They actually go to two places. They go to the blog and my inbox. So I'm not going to miss them. Um, but I'm up for questions asked anywhere. Just hit me up if you see me online. Well, last week we had someone, Dan, looking for games that seem to be much heavier than they actually are. <laughs> games that are intimidating and easily scare off players, but are actually easier to play or learn than they seem. This week, we're going to look at that question a bit more philosophically. Yeah, we're working on the show notes for last week. I actually started working on a discussion about what some games and designers do that make these heavier games easier to learn and play. And I had thought that we'd start off last week's episode by having that discussion, having a whole talk about what people can do to make the games more approachable and easier to learn. Then our moderator in chief and grammatical goddess Deanna and she games stepped in. Yeah. Deanna pointed out that starting off the conversation talking like that, we were going to run into a time problem that by the time we talk about making games easier, we wouldn't actually have time left to suggest any games for Dan, which is totally true, uh, especially based on our last game recommendation episode where we went over two hours just because we recommended so many games. Now, the thing is, I still wanted to have that conversation. Like this is, I personally think this is fascinating, the, what you can do to make games more approachable and easier. Now we're not thinking about accessible, approachable, two different things. And I think it's good content that I think, like if I'm interested, I'm assuming here that if I'm interested, someone out there also would be interested. I think it's cool content. And it's not something I've heard other people talk about before. So it's not something like everyone's talking about this. There's a lot of information on it. So I thought it would be something interesting for us to cover. So here we are this week talking about things that designers can do to make their games easier to play and learn. Ways to produce games that are simpler than they might first appear. Now, again, going back to last week we did talk about this a bit as a, as we were going through the games right as we went through each of the 12 games in the list and the three honorable mentions i did mention a bit about what elements of those games made them easier than expected except zolkin which i still haven't quite figured out today though what we're going to do is take those elements break them down a bit more talk about them plus i'm pretty sure we've got some today that didn't come up at all last week well, plus, with our great chat room here, hopefully anything that might slip by us will get picked up in the lobby. Yeah, we'll be checking back at the end of the discussion to see if they have anything to add. we got a ton of fine folks joining us tonight. I'm sure someone will have a great idea. So the first thing to me that makes or breaks a game in a way is a good rule book. One of the best things any game designer or publisher can do to make their games easier to learn is provide a good set of rules. A good rule book should not only be great at explaining how to play the game, but also be a piece of reference material that you can come back to. There should be lots of images showing actual gameplay and game components. And I do this in all of my unboxings. I always say with actual game components because I've seen books that don't do that that they use like icons or something and they don't actually show the bits in the game there should be lots of these images and examples examples should be huge there should be an example if you have five actions have an example of all five actions there should be an index some way to to find the information in this book once you've gone through it reading it cover to cover is one thing but when you're in the middle of a game you need to find that one rule you shouldn't have to flip through the entire book and then um summaries uh, whether that's an appendix or something on the back of the book, you want your round structure, your turn structure, your whole top to bottom, here's your game summarized in one page, should be there in one page, usually on the back of the book. And then any little fiddly microsystems, right? Little, whatever needs it. So like combat steps or an action flow chart or a tech tree or something like that. Any detailed step-by-step -step process that players have to go through and iterate through should be summarized somewhere in that book in an easy to find place. This is really where it all starts. Clarity, detail, and let's not forget readability. Glossaries of play terms, and you can always start mm -hmm. a fact right there in the book. If mm -hmm. questions came up during play testing that didn't seem to fit well in the rules or needed a little extra clarification. Uh, yeah. The DC Deck Builder is good for this. They they have some, some call outs in the back of the book that are just clarity. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, when cards interactions could be confusing, there's an extra bit in the back of the guide about those. 
Yeah, I, I'm trying to think of which company does it, but there's one company that the last section of every book is frequently um, missed rules or frequently misplayed rules. And I love that, that little boom, here's a little, hey, here's the stuff people tend to forget. Yep. Up next, and this kind of goes with the rule book to me. To me, this is as important. Our reference materials separate from the rule book, uh, quick start guides, um, quick set up rules on a separate sheet, um, a picture of board should be laid at the beginning of the game, a turn summary, the player summary, where there's a card for all the players that explains the turns or the possible actions, um, your tech tree printed out big, end game scoring reminders, um, the list of upgrade costs, like how much it costs to build your various things in the game. Again, this is all very game dependent. This is all the extra bits, the cards, reference sheets, summaries, foldouts, triptychs, whatever they happen to be. All the stuff that saves players from having to look up things in the big, thick rulebook. These not only serve as useful reference, but these are also great reminders of things that are easily forgotten. By having a card that shows the end game scoring in front of you for the whole game, you're not going to forget that one obscure thing that only matters at the end of the game that the teacher only taught you at the beginning of the rule book. By having it out in front of you, every time you look down at your player tableau, you're like, oh, that's right. At the end of the game, money is actually worth points, so I want to make sure I have some left as a <laughs> very vague example. Yeah, we shouldn't have to rely on third-party websites for summary and reference cards. The designers and publishers should know if a game is complex enough to require such details to make it easier to play. And I still say no game is simple enough to not have something. Just that one card that shows you the turn order. Like, unless you're already down to a one-page rulebook, just a one card, even roll for lasers could have used like a little card that just showed the icons. Just, just a little basic thing, right? And it's not a high cost item to throw in there. I love player reference material. Absolutely. Next is clarity of design. This actually covers a lot of things. Um, we're going to break this down a bit further than the last couple topics. Um, starting with the graphic design of things, we are talking about every aspect of design from layout to the board to the font everything that can be done to affect the the ui of the game the user experience um the user interface a lot can be done with graphic design to make games easier to play and i have since learned this is a new discovery for me is you know tool is the master you know tool works with Vital Lacerda to make some of the heaviest board games on the planet and Ian's design philosophy as a graphic designer as an artist is to make the game easier to play through the artwork and through the design which is brilliant uh things like what goes in a player's area like in your tableau versus what's on the board what information should be on the board to act as reminders like remember that end game scoring I was just talking about maybe instead of a card it's on the board so everyone can see it but then by putting it on the board, it only faces one player. So it better be something that can be recognized from all four directions. If it can't, then you put it on a card. Those kind of decisions. Um, for another example is resources. If you are playing a game where everyone has to know how much of everything everyone has, instead of having piles of stuff in front of you where you have to be like, how many do you have? How many do you have? Instead, put a track on the board that everyone can quickly look and see where it's at. Those are examples of things I know Ian O'Toole's done and other designers. I'm just giving Ian credit for being the master of this. There are every board game designer should be taking this into account. Another big topic when we're talking about design is typefaces. Please think about these details like serif or sans, kerning, sizing. As we learn from the Orleans expansion, think about the future. Maybe it isn't vital initially that your city names are readable easily from across the table, but mm -hmm. if you're going to expand later, it becomes vital. Think ahead. Clarity should also take into account the expected distance to the player. Mm -hmm. Something in your hand on a card can be smaller or fancier than something over on the board, which might be at arm's length or further from the player. Yeah. And talking about distance from player actually leads into our next topic of design, which is something that was proposed by Professor Scott Rogers, who is uh, very well known. He was originally youtube personality one of the first board game youtube personalities uh who now teaches board game design up here in canada who proposed what he calls the zones of play and his original theory has six zones of play some people have theorized more um which are the player's dominant hand 
which for me is my right, but it's dominant. It's right or left. The player's non-dominant hand, the tableau in front of the player, the board or the shared Spain place, because not everywhere has a board, the sideboard, so the stuff that's off the side of the rules, and then the rule book which is interesting because he also includes the internet with the rule book. So any other rule reference. Now, a lot of other people have pointed out the seventh spot being the box for being stuff you're not going to use, which I actually really like the idea of inclusion of the seventh. If there's something that doesn't matter in this game, but still is important to the game overall, like if you keep six out of seven and you put the seventh in the box, I perfect. I personally think Scott should add that as a seventh, but his original idea is six. And like, I, I don't want to get into too much detail here because I honestly think we could do an entire episode on the six zones of play. I don't know if we have to because if you listen to the Ludology podcast, just look up Ludology six zones of play and listen to that because they're going to do a way better job than Sean and I could. Um, what I would do, Stu, is what matters is to take these into consideration. So the most important thing to a player on your turn, on their turn, should be in their hand, in their dominant hand, if it's private information, or if everyone has to know what it should be in their table tableau, it shouldn't be over on a board. It shouldn't be on a sidebar. It definitely shouldn't be in the rule book. <laughs> so that's just a quick little summary about it. And this is something that I think is very important for designers to start thinking about. Now it's something that's always existed, but just Scott's done a good uh, job codifying it and breaking it down. That gives you a, a, a way to talk about it too. It's a, it's a good thing for a conversation between designers and and the publishers and the graphic artists and all yeah. of that. Think of it as a scale. So seven is the furthest thing from you or six is the furthest thing from you. Whereas one is up close. Uh, mm -hmm. The more important uh, items should be in those one to three and the less important or, or less often referenced in the four to six. Yep. It gives me flashbacks. I got to admit from uh, working in the automotive industry and in Kanban and Lee manufacturing and five S like, as soon as I saw this, I'm like, 5S your game. <laughs> you want the stuff you always use to be right here so you can reach it all the time. And the stuff you almost never touch should be over there. And the stuff you need once a month in a cabinet down in, you know, the maintenance area. Same idea, but applied to board games. All right, next is an element of design, and that is iconography. Um, this, to me, can make or break a game. Like, icons need to be easy to read, easy to see. Most importantly, easy to differentiate from each other. And some games fail on that part. And then the icon should actually relate to what you do, like what they represent, which I, I have seen. Why is this an arrow when you're not moving or passing or going? Don't use an arrow unless there's some kind of motion involved. Um, Race for the Galaxy is a game that I personally think does this totally wrong. There are too many icons that are too similar to each other and it's overwhelming and where the icons are matters as well as what the icons are. It's terrible. That's why that game, that's the opposite of what we talked about last week. That is a game that is more complicated than it looks like because of the iconography. Whereas Vinhos is really good at this one where everything on the board just makes sense. Like what's, why is there a cube there? Oh, that's a reminder that you have to place a cube. Well, of course, cause it's a cube and it has a down arrow, which generally means put it down. It means place a cube here. Wow, there's a down arrow with a cube next to this action. Probably means that when I take this action, I have to put a cube there. And like, it's that simple. You almost don't have to teach parts of the rules because the iconography is so clear. Again, thanks Eno Tool for that one. This is the the Eno Tool Love Fest tonight. <laughs> Unintentional, actually. You know, I, people people can take a lesson from IKEA on this one. There's a reason yeah. why they don't need words in their ma manuals because mm -hmm. they just explain it visually for everyone so that they don't have to worry about translations. Yeah, very and true. This is another area where it helps if you can see the future. If yeah. you are planning expansions or even considering expanding your game in the future, think about how you might be able to continue your design in a natural manner, mm -hmm. which remains consistent so that when you release expansion box four, you don't suddenly have a completely different type of symbols that don't match the rest of the feel of the game because you ran out of whatever you were doing before. Yeah. And on, in an, on an opposite way, what's funny is I've seen this not, not work badly, but I find the Marvel Legendary series. They came up with symbols for the one game, but then when you're playing some of the other games, they seem odd. You're like, what the heck is this fist supposed to mean? Well, well, that's just the symbol they've used in all their sets as an, yeah. as an example of it. Um, and as another example of actually planning ahead is Core World. So when Core Worlds from Stronghold Games came out, there was a spot on every card that had an icon. And the rule book literally said, these icons are for a later expansion. 
and they they had planned it out expecting to use these icons and again these were nice really clear they're they're basically the same idea as the ship colors in star realms it was it was a concept like that but that wasn't introduced in the core game right all right Sticking with design, but moving away from graphical, going into the physical realm, uh, that is component design. And this is one that I think people don't realize. And this one's very subtle. Like I think a lot of publishers are doing this and people don't necessarily realize they're doing it. And it's great that they're doing it or they're not thinking about it at all. And what this is, is you can do things with the physical components to make the game easier to learn. And the biggest thing here is theming the elements so that different components used for different parts of the game are physically different somehow. Uh, early games were terrible at this, especially Euro games. Early Mayfair, Rio Grande, Aaliyah games, I'm looking at all of you, everything was a cube or a meeple. It didn't matter if it was a resource spent, if it was a currency, if it was a representation of a penalty you took at the end of the game, it was all just different colored cubes. And yes, okay, the bad ones were, were whatever, the good ones were green and the bad ones were red, but that's about it. And that's how you could tell them apart. Um, for a great modern example of this is Raiders of the North Sea. Like this is the game I noticed it and went, wow. And then I started looking at my other games to see if other games were doing it because Everything, you're a Viking Raider. Everything you raid in that game is wood. It's all wooden components. And they all look unique, but everything you raid is wood. So you're like, okay, all the wood stuff's raiding. The money you have to spend are metal coins. So it's a completely different texture. It feels different. You use it for something different. You need plunder to go raiding. Now, you don't get plunder for raiding, so it's not wood. It's not a currency, so you don't spend it so it's not metal. Instead, those are cardboard. They're just cardboard chips because those get passed back and forth a lot. You're going to hand those all over the place. They're light. They're easy to handle. So you are you get uh, thin cardboard for those. Then anytime you collect something for the end of the game in that and you're going to score at the end of the game, it's a cardboard tile. And it's one that you might not even realize when you're playing, but whenever you trade in... Um, trade in your resources to improve and impress the chieftain you take a tile when you add in the expansion when you complete a quest you take a tile all of the tiles are end game scoring like that's brilliant the way they divided that up i think that like i want to see more games do it and as i look at the games i own i do see some games doing it like for example another good example is gold west where you have cubes for your two resources you use to build settlements and then metals which are different shaped hexa well not hexagons whatever i round circles with multiple different sides. One of them is a hexagon and then there's, I don't know, an octagon and a something else. And they're def differentiated, but like the metals are a different size, shape and texture than the resources used to build cities. And of course, with uh, Ryan and the Daniels regularly in our lobby, we can't forget to yes. mention about both color and legally blind players. Making the game easier to play means making it easier for everyone to learn and play, not just some players. Yes. All right. Next, this is something that's very modern, something we didn't have back in the day, is online support. Once a game's published and out in the wild, you're going to find out there's something wrong with the game. It's, it's pretty much inevitable. Like, no one releases a perfect game. If it's happened, uh, congratulations, whoever demands to make, do it. There's going to be mistakes in the rule book. There's going to be a missed rule. There's going to be an ambiguous situation or balance issues or anything else. Anything that generally gets thrown all together in an errata. All of this should be fixed. No game should just be left out there to live or die in its own merits. There should be a living PDF version of every board game rule book ever made, in my opinion. It, there should be a place to find the FAQ. This should be on your company's website and should be on Board Game Geek because those are the two places every gamer in the know is going to go and a gamer not in the know is going to at least check the company website. I would go so far as to suggest having a QR code in your rule book leading to where to find this information. Even if you don't have any yet, like when you release this game, make an FAQ page, put a QR code in your rule book. And when people scan it, if there's nothing to see here, say, hey, we got it right. There's nothing wrong. If you've noticed a problem with our game, contact us here. And then when inevitably you do find problems with the games, you fill that page up. Now, again, jumping back to the zones we were talking about, Scott Rogers considers this part of zone six. This is part of your play space in modern gaming. I Every game I play, at some point, I grab my phone and Google something, and 99% of the time, I'm going to Board Game Geek to find the answer. Like, like games we have played hundreds of times, just that one situation comes up, we're like, 
oh man, I don't know. Is it this or this? And I, I expect to find an answer nowadays. Yep. And at, at the very least, as we've discussed previously, put it on Board Game Geek. It's almost a sure thing that Board Game Geek is going to rank higher in Google than many <laughs> publishers. So True. use their forums, their file space to host your FAQs and living rule books. It's a good chance that gamers will find it there first, even if it is on your own website. I mean, you can if it is on your website, great. Go to Board Game yes. Geek and put a link to your own website. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just want to shout out today to uh, Cool Mini or Not, Simon, or whatever you want to call them, uh, even just today, they published a giant FAQ for Cthulhu Death May Die that yep. answered a whole bunch of things and really broke down things really nicely, as well as being an FAQ. It was a full uh, walkthrough nice. of, of information. Uh, and so they are still supporting that, and they've got it right there on the, on their, the product page mm -hmm. for Death May Die. Now, what I'd also appreciate, and I realize this is a cost issue, is I would love to see that information end up in the next printing of the games. Like that, that's a please if you can. Now it doesn't necessarily mean reprint your whole rule book. Maybe it's just you get the manufacturer to throw in a little one sheet. That one sheet could even say CRFAQ here or have the actual rules on it. Back in the day, I remember every time you bought an expansion for a game, you found out what you were doing wrong in the base game. Like I would get a new Talisman expansion, Talisman the Dragon, and I'd open it up and there'd be an FAQ and I'd be like, oh, I've been playing Talisman wrong for two years. <laughs> Interesting to know. Like it shouldn't have to wait for an expansion. But if you are publishing expansion, again, toss that info in there. If there's a problem, um, we reviewed Eminent Domain last week. Eminent Domain is fantastic for that. Every Eminent Domain book has a rule clarification from the original rule book. And it's the same rule they keep clarifying, but it's an important rule to clarify. I would love to see that. Again, just keeping a up-to-date version somewhere online I can find will still make me happy. That next step would be great. All right. Also, sticking with online in today's internet world, I personally think every game nowadays should have a video tutorial. This goes back to, I think, the third thing we ever talked about on, like, I think it's episode three. I may have it off, which was teaching games. And we talked about how people learn and how when teaching games, you should try to present the information in multiple different ways because some people are going to learn better by watching or hearing over reading. And I expect nowadays to have both options available. I should be able to go somewhere and put on a video and either watch it listen to it both or read the rule book. I should have that variety should be available. Now, thankfully more and more publishers are jumping on board with this. It is becoming more and more common. There are some very well-known uh, video tutorials, teachers, I don't know what you call them, YouTube stars, I guess, whatever, content creators who specialize on making actual play videos. And what's awesome is that companies are now hiring these people, which is great to see. That's great for them. We've done a couple how to plays. We're nowhere near good enough. We don't need a publisher to pay us to do this. We're, we're, we'd, have, we'd have to up our production and, and professionalism quite a bit. But even if a publisher is not doing it, someone out there is going to do it. it like, unless the game's from 1987 and hasn't been republished for years, even then there's probably someone who's done a video on how to play it nowadays. Like it's very seldom you can't find one. So as my own experience has taught me learning games with, with YouTube, the quality of those self-made video tutorials varies wildly from our mm. less than ideal uh, things to some really professional stuff like mm. done by, by gaming rules and, and some of the other uh, content creators out there. I keep finding more of them all the time. Uh, if you merely trust the internet to do it for you as a publisher, you're giving up control just mm -hmm. as much as if you let someone who bought the game write your rulebook for you. Yeah, in a way that's true. And plus, you're not trusting someone else to teach your game even, right? Like you're, 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 you're putting an awful lot of trust in your rulebook, the person who's reading that rulebook, and their ability to teach other people how to play. Because I don't know any group where all the players about to play a game read the rule book ahead of time. Like that's just not something that happens. Maybe back in the day, that was a thing where everyone would read the rules before. Like I've tried it. I'm like, Hey, we're going to play this Sunday and I'll send the PDF of the rules to everyone. Two out of five people will have actually read it. It just, it doesn't happen. It's not something you can expect. I send five people a link to a 20 minute YouTube video. You will guarantee probably four of those five people will have watched it before showing up. It's just, and the control as Sean mentioned is a huge part of it. 
All right. So that's some of the physical things that you can improve on um, to help learning and playability in games. But let's dive into some mechanical things you can do. Things you can do in the mechanics of the game, not timographic design or component quality or the rule book, but things you can actually do in the core loop of the game to make them better. And the biggest one to hear, this is the one that last week out of 15 games, I think we talked about it on 12 of them, is to limit player options. This is the biggest thing a designer can do to make heavy games more approachable. One of the things that affects weight in games, which if you want to know more about weight in games, we got a whole podcast about that too, and blog post, is the decision tree, the number of the number of branches on the decision tree, the number of options a player is presented to at one time is the, one of the biggest factors in game weight. By limiting that, you make the game easier. This is the whole how do you eat an elephant, right? The, the old adage, you eat it one bite at a time. By presenting players with only a limited number of options at the start of the game and slowly adding new options as the game goes on, you can make the most complex game start off simple and build at a rate that players are going to be comfortable with. So take the video game industry as a shining example of this. Not of many things, but of this. <laughs> Onboarding in stages is just the way to go. How you go about it will largely depend on your game and many factors about how it's played. But knowing that you should take the time to onboard players in a gradual manner is a vital piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Now, this is a big one, right? So what I want to do is break down a bit on what you can do to limit player options. So that mechanically, depending on what kind of game you're playing. So the biggest place you're going to see this when it kind of smacks you in the face is any worker placement or action selection game where not all of those spots or all those actions are available at the start. Now I've seen this done by only having a set number of options even out there. So you only have whatever the starting board, uh, an example of that is Agricola where you only have so many actions. And then as the game goes on, you're going to add more. Another way is to add cost to the actions that the players won't be able to afford at the start of the game. So here's all 10 things you can do, but on turn one, you're going to be able to afford these three. I would say not having them out is better because when all 10 are out, you kind of have to explain all 10 of them and that can overwhelm someone. But uh, both ways are better than going, here's all 10 options, pick, it's your first turn, go. Yeah, you can afford to do any of them. Now, another way of doing this is limiting resources. This is similar to the whole you can only afford to do the first three, but if you can only afford to buy a limited number of things, it's the same thing as having a limited number of actions. And whether your resources, action points, or money to spend, or whatever it is, there's no point looking at that super galactic star freighter with the extra guns on it when all you've got is two mega credits to be able, and all you can buy is maybe a basic engine. It's just, it's the same situation as the last one, just created in a different way. Similar to limiting the start of options at the start of the game, many games instead do it the other way around where they add content as you play. Now, I'm not just talking about action spots. I'm talking about content. Like this is looking way beyond just action point systems. I am talking about totally unlocking new content as you get further in the game. This is a great way to build on the weight and complexity. The main place you see this, of course, are campaign games where when you finish scenario one, you go to scenario two and scenario two has something else. Um, a great example of this that really breaks it up and throws it in your face is the Harry Potter Hogwarts battle deck building game. Cause you play through books one at a time. And when you finish one book, you open a box for book two and get new stuff. And another very recent example, the new hotness right now would be Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion and the way the first five intro scenarios work. Now, once you get past those, goodbye onboarding, but that first five scenarios in that, do that whole, all right, here's the basics. Okay, here's the basics plus a bit more. All right, now let's give you a little bit more. Okay, now we're going to try this, and then, all right, here you go. Let's see how you do with the full rules. Yeah, and it's especially nice to note that Hogwarts Battle even has a skip function. So if you're with a bunch of advanced deck-building players, you can jump right to that fourth mm. step and get into the game with a lot more meat to it. But if you're teaching it to your family or to non-experienced deck-builder players... You start at one and you work your way all the way through and the beginners are brought up to speed uh, nice and easy. Yep. 
And Jaws the Lion actually does the, the same thing. And uh, someone actually pointed that out that we didn't cover that when we we're comparing the two games is that um, Isaac suggests the experienced players start again four. I don't know if four is the magic number. Start on scenario four instead of starting at scenario one. Uh, like personally, I don't know. Like, like Deanna and I were experienced players. I took the time to go through the earlier ones. Like they're simple, quick. We pounded through three in one night but i could see the appeal where some people might want to just skip the intro stuff and dive into the almost full game it's it's scenario four is when you start using the full monster decks and when you start getting xp in and the elements are there so like pretty much all the full rules for gloom haven are there now speaking of jaws of lion um those those first five scenarios are what you would call a tutorial and tutorials are something fantastic for making your games easier to understand i love it when a heavy game includes some form of tutorial that slowly introduces players to the game. Now, again, Jaws does the five starters, but another example of this is Mage Knight, the board game. This is one of the longest, most extensive tutorials I've ever seen, but it breaks the game down in such a way that it takes one of the heavier games ever published and makes it seem almost simple by the time you're done, if you follow through that steps. Um, Sometimes this is explicit, right? Like the tutorial is like, hey, it's a tutorial. But other times they don't announce it, right? It's just part of the design. So an example, Sean earlier was talking about Cthulhu Death May Die. Well, they did it in Cthulhu Death May Die by making scenario one rather basic. Scenario two, all of a sudden you have to worry about carrying around items and dealing with one extra monster type. And then scenario three adds on another thing. And there's nowhere in the book that says scenario one's a tutorial, but it just, it creates a tutorial by ramping up the difficulty of each scenario. Now, just be mindful as you're designing these things about the balance between guiding and hand-holding. You don't want to talk down to your players. Mm. Now, simpler, similar to tutorials, you have simpler modes of play. This is, this is something separate. So this would be like the family version or the beginner version or the first time you play. Uh, Settlers of Catan is one that has this that a lot of people don't realize because they've learned Catan from other people, but there is actually a recommended board layout and starting position for all player counts so that everyone is, is that's new to the game doesn't have to do the hard decision because the first thing you do when you play Settlers of Catan is place your settlement and if you don't know the game, how do you know where to place it? So this takes away that decision point. Agricola, we mentioned earlier, has a family mode where you don't use the cards. Pulsar 2849 has a mode where you don't use the individual player boards, the player HQs. This is a great way to teach the core concept of a game and the core mechanics and make sure players fully grasp the important parts before giving all that, the, the shine, the sparkle. Yeah, when, it, when we taught Pulsar, you guys just threw me in the deep end uh, with, that, with the player cards. Although I think discussing, I think after discussing it, we did a, a rough, like, let's try the first two turns to learn. Okay. And then, okay, you know what you're doing? All right, let's throw the player boards in too because you're feeling comfortable. All right, yeah, because I'm like, I swear I taught the game without them. <laughs> And then we played with them. But so. I think, but I think, and we've talked about this when it comes to Pulsar 2849 is get in there and, and play those first couple of rounds to figure out how the dice bidding mm -hmm. works and things. All right. Taking the beginner or family mode to the next level. Some games actually have simpler versions of themselves that are games on their own. Um, I, I don't always can't always recommend these because they're not always a logical progression. Like Jaws of the Lion is a perfect one. It is a simplified version of Gloomhaven that is a great stepping stone into it. There are others. The Ticket to Ride City series of uh, New York, London, and I think Amsterdam's coming soon are really simpler Ticket to Ride games. Um, then stepping down even further, there's the Ticket to Ride First Journey. Uh, another example is King Domino versus Queen Domino. And now there's even a kid's King Domino that I just learned about called Dragon Domino that's an intro. But again, you got to kind of watch these because some of them aren't the same game. Like my first Carcassonne has tiles and meeples, but that's it. Like it's not Kark. It's not going to help you learn Kark. It's a great game. My kids can play with tiles and meeples that kind of looks like Carcassonne, but it's not actually a stepping stone. And if you ever do want to know if a game's related to each other, you can find that information out on Board Game Geek, or you can ask experts like us. Yeah. So just don't necessarily go out and pick up Catan Jr. to learn Catan, but if you're teaching to children, that may be appropriate. Yeah. So yeah, Catan Jr. is kind of a step. It gets you the resource management and the rolling for resources, but yeah, it's, it's a little too simple in a way. 
Now, another thing that can be done to make games less complicated is to share that complexity with everyone else. Split the cognitive load between the players by making the game cooperative or by having a cooperative mode in the game. A great example of this recent example is Vitalis Erta CO2. This is a meaty Euro about environmentalism and power plants and getting rid of um, polluting fuels and replacing with green energy. And it was a cutthroat, rather hard to learn game. They recently published the second edition of this and they swapped the game to be cooperative at its start, like basically cooperative with a variant for competitive. And the great part about cooperative games is when you have players at different experience levels, because this is where the experienced player can help the less experienced players and not just like dominate them in a player versus player game where the experienced player is like, ah, I know what I'm doing and I'm going to kick your butts. Instead, they get to help and work with everyone else. So, of course, as ever, we do often call out the risks of quarterbacking. Mm. So you just need to be aware that even if you're, you know, you can dominate in a co-op game too. So uh, just be aware that you, you should be teaching, not, uh, you know, co not running the game for them. Yes, people still should get to make their own decisions. Another example of a game that's now made cooperative that was competitive is Star Wars Imperial Assault. With the app, it is now a co-op game, which leads me to the next way to make a complicated game less complicated. Throw in an app. This is going to become more and more common, I think, as times go on. This includes ones like Imperial Assault that basically takes over the role of the, the DM, the dark side player, but also includes helper apps. Uh, the one we use the most often is the awesome Gloomhaven helper app that manages the bad guys, conditions, uh, health, money, tracks XP. Like, it takes all of that and removes that element of Gloomhaven so you can focus on playing your cards and beating the scenario. And technically it works for Jaws of the Lion as well. So as court, you do need to remember that if you're leaning heavily on an app as a publisher, you need to support that app for as long as you want your game to be available, mm -hmm. played and learned. In the cases of the Gloomhaven app, it's actually a third party app. So it could go away at any time yeah. because it's not actually related to the game directly. Yeah, though I know Isaac has endorsed that app many times. I don't I'm hoping he kind of gave him some money or something. Like that is such a good app. All right, final one. It's been a fairly long topic. This is this is an interesting one that's a little hard to describe. This is tying the theme of the game to the mechanics. And I know we get called out, or at least I get called out all the time for skipping over to the theme, but you know what? Theme can matter. And where this matters the most is I find when the mechanics of the game are actually tied to the theme tightly, like they make logical sense, the players are going to remember those mechanics because they just make sense in the game world. Uh, again, I'm going to bring up Vinhost Deluxe, not just because I've been recently playing it, but it's a great example of a game where the mechanics in the game just make sense. Like you have wine experts. Well, why would you buy a wine expert? Well, they're going to give you a bonus and give you something you can do. Okay. That part makes sense. But also you're going to go to a tasting party. You're going to go to a wine festival. And if you have the right expert with you, your wine's going to score better. Well, it just makes sense. If I'm going to a con, I bring my expert with me to sell my wines. Like it, it makes sense. Or the fact that when I buy a cellar and put it into a vineyard in the region of Lisboa, the reputation of Lisboa goes up. And that's actually represented the game. That's the put the cube thing I was talking about earlier, actually, is there's a little symbol next to pushing a seller that shows a cube symbol, which means wherever you put the seller, put down a reputation cube. Just little things like that. And there's more to it. Like the way your wine ages, it moves to the right every year and it becomes worth more and you move it on your seller. Like almost every mechanic in that game, except for the very basic worker placement, how to choose your action is tied to the theme in some way. And that makes what is really a heavy game just makes sense when you're playing it. It's just like, well, wait, here is another example. What does buying a seller do? Well, it makes your wine's value go up. Well, duh. <laughs> uh, and, and in a game like Pulsar, uh, it's really about removing those abstract ideas. Moving a meeple on a grid won't have the same mental connection for a player as moving a little spaceship hmm. on, along, on a path between drawn out stars on a galaxy. And I think for me, that's really what separates experiences with a game like Pulsar, which I is a meaty game that I was drawn to immediately versus a game like Lords of Waterdeep, which people love and isn't all that difficult. And it had all the text and the art to, to be D&D, &D, mm -hmm. but 
it really just felt like an abstract worker placement with a very pretty D&D paint job on it. No, it's a perfect sense in Lords of Waterdeep. Why do I need three fighters, a wizard, and six thieves and seven dollars to domesticate owl bears? Like, yeah. why? <laughs> there's there's no tie in there. Like yeah. it's it's got a neat theme, and I find the game more fun when I talk about the fact that I domesticated owl bears. But honestly, yeah. or why when I go to the print shop do I get a dollar and someone else gets two? Like it just it's it's all just mechanics with a paste on theme. Well, there you have some things that can be done to make board games easier to learn and play. Let's head mm. over to the lobby and we'll see if anyone in our chat room has had anything to add. Uh, I see uh, Ryan talking about uh, some great things. He joined us a little later, but uh, he notes that most digital rule books and video tutorials leave out information that makes learning game from it difficult for non-visual players. Yeah, the pro this is it, this is where you you need the ones produced by the publisher or by by uh, like Rodney Smith. Watch it played. You got Rado runs through Rado for non visual players would be bad because Rado makes mistakes, and Rado corrects them in the Klingon subtitles, but that doesn't help someone who can't see. So Rado does fall down on that aspect of it. Or gaming rules, uh, Paul Grogan. I gaming rules I personally find is the most thorough. Whereas uh, Rodney, I find great, but Rodney has a habit of using the term. I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. And that's a, it's a rather famous term of Rodney's. And I like it. I, it amuses me. But there, if you're learning the game and you're doing it because you can't read, how do you discover that on your own, right? Like, you're, it'd be nice if, if Rodney added a separate video of those things that you should click my other video to discover them with me or discover them on your own would be a, nice, a next step for, for people right. with, with vision and hearing problems. Jumping back a little ways, uh, when we were talking about iconography, uh, apparently you and D were trying to remember a game and Bastille yes. was that game. Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I came up with Vinhos because I just played Vinhos, so it was fresh in my mind. It is a good example, but Bastille blows it away. Bastille's iconography and board design is fantastic. The only thing that I think could have been done better is it's very, everyone's looking at the board this way centric. And, and I don't know if they could have made it so the city was round, so things were facing different players. But other than that aspect, like the flow f makes sense. And the icons, like you just said, how many crowns do you have? I can just do this and kind of look and see how many crowns people have. And, and again, why do I want crowns where there's a huge thing on the side of the board that shows you what crowns are for? And then there's a scoring track. And, oh, it, it is a fantastic game for iconography. That is still, like, uh, Travis from Queen Games told me this was a hidden gem. And, and it hasn't gotten enough hype. And I totally agree. And that took a few plays. I'll admit, the first time I played it, I was like, eh, about this game uh it wasn't a complaint of the iconography of the design there's just some weird things with collecting people that you need to kind of understand how it works before you play uh it, it wouldn't have been on our easy to learn games though the iconography does make that game easier to learn than it seems i will admit it's but there are other aspects of the game that i don't think make it an easier than expected game uh jeff uh, seuss um pointed out uh, a great question on the topic of player of rule summary cards. How do you get players to clue in that this rule summary you've given them is really important and to actually look at it? I accept saying that. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, I, I think that's a player experience thing. I, I, this is, so this is it. If those became more common, if more people use them and if every game had them, then people would use them more, right? They'd be like, oh yeah, this is obviously my card that's going to remind me of my things to do. And if every game had them, then people would be more accepting of them. Where if it's the thing you only see once every six games, you're just like, what's this a card or a summary? Well, you just told me everything. I don't need that. Plus the information has to be useful. So that's another aspect of it is put something on there that they do have to reference that makes them look at it in a way. So like if at the end of the round, you need to calculate how much grain you generate and you put that graph on the card, then they're going to be looking at the card. And then under that, it's the end game scoring reminder. So they're like, okay, I'm calculating my grain. Oh, that's right. I want to also remember I need cows. And again, I'm not referencing any particular game here. I'm just coming up with. And I think mechanics. what it went, because games aren't doing this often enough, what might be a good idea is bring this to your table. So your yeah. personal table at home Start getting reference cards, whether you make your own or you download them from a third party, but make that reference card uh, use 
a, a regular thing at your table so that your players know to expect it and understand that it has value and can speed the game along. Um, Anything else? From uh, Stonemeyer Pennywise notes is good about colorblind friendly games uh, awesome. using a number of different apps to see how uh, how things. Yeah, look we brought those up workout. before in, in previous episodes. We've talked about them. There are there are two or three or four. Like there's some websites where you can basically. Yeah. Uh, upload your image and it'll show it to you in various different things. Yeah, the one I found was... Now, does Stonemeyer also do the feel different? Because that's that next level, right? So I, I talked about Gold West earlier in the show. And one of the things Gold West did, and what's odd is they did it for the metals, not the, the wood or the stone, is the silver, the gold, and the copper have a different number of sides on the cylinders. So you can, by touch, tell them apart. Besides the fact that they're also painted metallic and colorblind friendly versus not is great for this and another one was it was it endeavor i think was another one where they had done the different shapes of everything so that every resource was was tactically different clans of caldonia is a perfect example of that every single one of the resources like back in the day those would have been cubes every single they would have been different color cubes yep. cows would have been one cube color cube and and i don't know they would have done something red totally cows different. white sheep and you know yeah, <laughs> it, wool would have been gray yep. and wood would have been brown there's no wood cheese would have been yellow the fact that that game has a different shape resource for everything is great. And then they have flat versions of those that are your actual resources you collect. So your production buildings are in your player color are each uniquely shaped. And then the resources you gather are flat wood. And like, so you have, again, the difference of, well, this shape sheep obviously is a production building because it looks like a little meeple sheep and this wool is a round thing that's flat. So it's obviously a resource like that is something I think is next level stuff that I would love. I love seeing more and more of. Now, of course, you get into the what's becoming more and more common are the 3D, like the fully whether 3D printed or sculpted or resin or whatever, like Scythe is is one of those games that that people upgrade their game of Scythe for all different um, for all the different resources. So instead of having like little wooden things, you have things that like look more like real things. And uh, then Jeff early in the show in the show notes pointed out that Scythe did the thing with the actions. So the plastic units fight, wooden units don't fight. And I think wooden units are resources, I think is what it is, is the, what you're fighting over. Again, I, I had a bad experience with size, so it's not a game I know a lot about. I remember plastic mechs moving on the board. <laughs> and then cubes, if I remember, were all used to track your actions. Like they were all, you only use those on your board. So again, you wouldn't get them mixed up with the resources. All right, I'm not seeing anything else from the chat room. So we're going to wrap up this Ask the Bellhop episode section segment remember if you've got a game or game night question for us all you got to do is go to tabletopbellhop.com click on ask the bellhop fill out the form there or possibly even simpler is questions at tabletopbellhop.com <laughs>